In this presentation, I will be illustrating how to convert an open chain structure known as a Fisher projection into its cyclic hemiacetyl structure, which is known as a Hayworth projection. The example I will be using is the monosaccharide D-galactose. Typical exam questions with model answers will be presented at the end of the video to help you with your understanding. Before I begin, I just need to clarify which regions of the molecule are involved in forming the cyclic structure. Namely, the OH colored in red on carbon number 5 and the aldehyde functional group located at the top, which I have colored in yellow. In short, these two functional groups react to form an intramolecular bond that connects carbon number 5 to carbon number 1 and thus establishing the cyclic structure known as a Hayworth projection. The first thing that you need to do is to rotate the Fisher projection by 90 degrees clockwise. Or put another way, if I was to knock this molecule down to the right, all these circled atoms on the right of the vertical line would be facing down, while all the atoms on the left would be facing up. So let's begin by drawing this cyclic structure by beginning with carbon number one and the aldehyde functional group. Let's now move on to carbon two. You may recall that these Hayworth projections, these cyclic structures, look hexagonal when dealing with monosaccharides such as galactose and glucose. So now we've got to bend this bond forward with the endpoint representing the position of the second carbon. Now, in the Fisher projection on the left, you can see that the OH group is pointing to the right, which means the OH in the Hayworth projection will be pointing down. With its corresponding hydrogen pointing up. Moving on now to carbon number three, if we look at the Fisher projection, we can see that the OH group is pointing to the left, which means in the Hayworth projection, it will be facing up, with its corresponding hydrogen facing down. Now, connecting on to carbon number four, I'm going to have to bend this bond back into the screen. Looking at the corresponding Fisher projection, you can see that the OH functional group is pointing to the left, which means that at carbon number four, the OH will be pointing up with its corresponding hydrogen pointing down. Now, moving on to carbon number five, things start to get interesting. Let me explain. Based on how I have approached this so far, you would expect the OH colored in red to be pointing down on the Hayworth structure, with its corresponding hydrogen on the opposite side, leaving the CH2OH hanging to the right of carbon number 5. If left unaltered, this would lead to the formation of an intramolecular bond between the OH from carbon number 6 and the aldehyde functional group located on carbon number 1, resulting in a 7-membered ring as opposed to a 6-membered ring. Note how the oxygen from the CH2OH would make up the 7th member of the ring if this was allowed to occur. Now, both galactose and glucose prefer to exist in nature in the form of a 6-membered ring, as this is more thermodynamically stable. Hence, in order to complete the cyclic structure, a conformational change needs to occur. More specifically, the OH group currently located below carbon number 5 needs to occupy the position of the CH2OH. Fortunately, single covalent bonds are able to rotate around their central axis, and more specifically, in this case, around carbon 5. This results in the following conformational structure. Now in its new position, this single OH is able to interact with the aldehyde group from carbon number one. 
OK, let's now expand this OH so that we can see the covalent bond that's attached between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Let's now draw the two lone pairs or non-bonding electrons that reside on the oxygen. Now, this delta negative oxygen is attracted to the delta positive carbon within the aldehyde functional group. The oxygen donates one of its lone pairs to the carbon, creating a covalent bond that completes the ring structure. The lower oxygen subsequently accepts a pair of bonding electrons, giving it a negative charge. While this is occurring, the oxygen atom which was responsible for forming this new bond has become positively charged. In order to rectify this, it takes both electrons from the covalent bond that attaches it to the hydrogen. This breaks the bond and forms a positively charged ion which subsequently attacks the negatively charged oxygen on the other side. Once in position, a lone pair of electrons from the negatively charged oxygen is donated to the hydrogen ion, establishing a covalent bond and the creation of an OH functional group on carbon number one. A couple of examinable points that you need to be aware of regarding the formation of the cyclic structure. First of all, the new bond linking the oxygen from carbon number 5 to carbon number 1 leads to the formation of a new centre of chirality on carbon 1 and is termed the anomeric carbon. Recall that in order to have a chiral carbon centre, that carbon needs to be attached to four different substituents. Note how the corresponding carbon within the Fischer projection was not chiral as it was only attached to one, two and three substituents or groups of atoms. In addition you may recall that the intersections between vertical and horizontal lines within the Fischer projection indicate the positions of chiral carbons and more specifically on carbon number two, three, four and five given a total of four chiral carbons within the open chain structure. The Hayworth projection however has a total of five chiral carbons located at positions one, two, three, four and carbon number five. So in short the general rule is that cyclic structures have one more chiral carbon than their corresponding open chain structure for monosaccharides. So when we move from a Fischer projection to a Hayworth projection, we increase the number of chiral carbon centers by one. You also need to be aware of the relative position of the newly formed OH group on the anomeric carbon and whether it is on the same or opposite side of the ring to that of the CH2OH group. The current illustration depicts the OH pointing down and is on the opposite side of the ring to the CH2OH group. The key words here are on opposite side. In this case it would be labeled the alpha anima and would be called alpha degalactose. So once again, if these two groups are on opposite sides of the ring, the molecule is labeled the alpha anima. If, however, the OH was pointing up and therefore on the same side of the ring as the CH2OH, the key words here being same side, it would be classified as the beta anima and it would be labeled beta degalactose. Using the relative positions of these two groups and whether they are on the same or opposite side of the ring allows you to correctly label both D and L isomers of monosaccharides. To illustrate the utility of this method, have a look at the following example. Here is an illustration of the cyclic structure for L galactose. You will quickly see that the CH2OH group is below the ring and therefore pointing down. Okay, so how would you go about labeling this molecule? Would it be beta or alpha? Using the same versus opposite side method, 
you can see that the OH on carbon number one is on the opposite side of the ring to the CH2OH. Or put another way, the OH is facing up and the CH2OH is facing down. Recall when they are facing on opposite sides of the ring. This makes it the alpha anima. Okay, now that I've clarified this point, attempt the following questions. Now there'll be a set of three learning checks. For each learning check, what I'd like you to do is attempt the question, pause the video, and then resume the video once you think you have an answer, and compare your answer to the model answer provided. So let's begin with learning check number one. Attempt to draw the Hayworth projection for alpha D-glucose from its Fisher projection shown below. Okay, so this is the Hayworth projection for D-glucose. In addition, you'll see that the OH on the anomeric carbon is on the opposite side of the ring structure relative to the CH2OH. This makes it alpha D-glucose. Now, if you've struggled with this question, my suggestion to you is to go back to the steps that were used to draw D-galactose, and more specifically alpha D-galactose, earlier in the video. Once you've familiarized yourself with those steps, come back to this question and attempt it again. Okay, let's move on to learning check number two. Attempt to draw the Hayworth projection for beta D-glucose from its Fisher projection shown below. In this example, the OH on the anomeric carbon is on the same side of the ring structure relative to the CH2OH. This makes it beta D-glucose. Finally, here's learning check number three. Four questions in total. And here are the answers. So for question one, it was four. Question two, five. And question three, the new bond linking the oxygen from carbon five to carbon number one leads to the formation of a new center of chirality. And more specifically, on carbon one is termed the anomeric carbon. In short, the general rule is that the cyclic structure has one more chiral carbon than its corresponding open chain structure for that monosaccharide. Finally, with question number four, if the OH on the anomeric carbon is facing on the opposite side of the ring to the CH2OH, this makes it an alpha anima. If they are on the same side, of course, it's the beta anima. Now, this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you have found it a useful addition to my other earlier presentations on how to convert Fisher projections into Hayworth projections for monosaccharides such as glucose and galactose. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video and don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to keep up to date with my future presentations.